Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, and so, um, Ken, I thank you for the response, and George, for the intro. What we thought we'd do is open it up uh, to uh, community questions. We have a few here, and we'll wrap up as, as time um, moves up, moves out, I guess. The, um, I think, uh, you know, sort of a transition here we saw from the examples from the CDS and HL7 world and with, with EHRs that, that Ken presented as sort of paradigms for thought as we think about phenotype. Um, in our um, uh, in each of our research repositories, and and you know we've seen an emerge that there is a growth from um, what we've done in research cases and and you know, sort of FKB uh, published algorithms to their use in clinical applications, both within our institutions for finding populations as well as other uh, decision support metrics. Um, I know um, uh, many people probably have thoughts or questions, so let me just uh, I think open it up to folks for ideas and questions. Yeah, so for those of us not in the field, since I, I, I thought Ken's uh, talk was quite interesting, so just I'll give one example. So he mentioned HL7 clinical quality language. So how does that relate to what Emerge has done or is doing? Yeah, so um, uh, there will be many perspectives on this. I'll take the first crack. Um, and so, so a lot of that work is in the space of using an EHR for reporting metrics. Um, and sometimes the numeric... The, uh, the new Welcome to WebEx. Enter your access code or meeting number followed by pound. We're just going to dial in again because the earlier been cut off the WebEx connection. Sorry about that. It's okay to talk about my phone. Enter your attendee ID number followed by pound. If you do not know your attendee number. Okay, you can go ahead. All right. Um, the uh, uh, so so when you think about these two processes, um, uh, you know, most of us in Emerge have actually built parallel research repositories, and a lot of times these are you know sort of the clinical world is looking at numerator and denominators for reporting characteristics, and may have different um, uh, premises around sensitivity and specificity than we do in the research world. Um, and um, uh, you know, the other thing that's interesting is most of them are contextualized within you know current practice. So they don't have to deal with the decades of different mappings of lab codes and things like that. Um, and, and, but I still think they're useful paradigms to think about um, uh, and uh, provide some examples of what's happened in the contextualization of current quality reporting on EHRs, um, which you know, don't have to deal with you know, 644 different albumin codes. Um, like we have to deal with, you know, with Marshfield with, I don't know how many, 100 decades of, no, not quite that long. But, you know, of, of VHR records have highly evolved over time, as, as we have in Columbia and everybody else here. So uh, I'll note, so CQL is basically an expression language. So when you want to say, like, if this is true, you know, then consider an exclusion criteria met, et cetera. So it's, it's like, you know, if they've had a uh, uh, diagnosis of this within this time frame, then consider them to have met the diagnosis uh, requirement. Um, it can be used for any kind of phenotyping. Uh, it's spe specifically usable for things like clinical distance support as well. Um, uh, I do agree with the data mapping issue, but that's kind of orthogonal to the issue of the clinical quality language. That's more an issue with the data model. Um, and I think SIMI is probably going to end up being the solution to it that actually fixes it. The place where the vendors currently are focused are uh, these U.S. score fire profiles. And the other quick thing would be the difference in use of NLP. Just to highlight that, which you brought up, Ken. So CKB is an awesome resource, and currently it's generally in the Word docs. And I was wondering if there are plans to make it computable, or if that's even worth it because of the issues we've talked about, that it has to be done differently for any different place. So why bother? I guess I'll take that. Um, the, so two couple of responses to that is, uh, so the FEMA architecture that George mentioned, um, is actually built into FKB as a beta, um, and uh, that was built off of some of the um, uh, uh, National Quality Forum-based uh, XML standards, which probably could evolve to um, uh, ECQMs. Um, the um, as as one answer to that, we also have OMOP um, uh, modules that uh, George and others have put in as SQL that could be directly executed, and uh, that is now searchable. So there's a uh, you can search for all the MOBOP, OMOP uh, entries. 
Um, so those are two ways in which we're trying to promote uh, reuse of um, computable things. There's also um, nine modules have been uploaded, which are computable, and have been shown to transfer between different uh, EHRs. Just to point out, <clears throat> so the, ironically, the phenotyping work group never talks about EHRs because the presumption is the academic medical centers has abstracted their data from the EHR, stuck it in a data warehouse, the ones that are eMERGE uh, collaborators, and it's about uh, consistency as the conversion that Josh is talking about. Um, uh, could everyone on the WebEx please mute? We're hearing some background. Um, and then there's a, but there's a step that I didn't mention that I should have, which is that we have our local databases. Then there's the central database where the e-record counter, we're actually putting more and more variables centrally that we can all share. So that it's actually is defined to be the same data model because in fact it's shared among us. And we counted it earlier as 15 variables, but actually if you look at it, each of those variables is, is a zillion different levels. So it's really thousands of variables that are being included and put centrally that we can work on. And I don't and think curated. any of us, what's that? And curated. and curated. So that we've gone through our decades of data and figured out, we used to call our lab test this, then we called our lab test that, and we changed it probably six times in the last 20 years. And we've done those mappings, so when it goes into the e-record counter, we're all going to the same format. And as Michael pointed out, that's where a lot of the work is. The, the pain of phenotyping is getting into a consistent format. I think this this will work. Um, so you, a couple of you have mentioned that for managing, um, analyzing drug use, that Rx norm is useful at at least saying what what medication we're talking about, but that there's not standardized ways of documenting route. Is that like a, a easy win task that could be taken on to ask the EHR vendors and others involved in getting these primary data to come up with standardized terms for, for route so we could at least manage so, that? So I think I brought it up, so I'll address it. So um, there are actual standards for route. There are things like the FDA route codes. There's NOMAD codes. The issue is it just hasn't made it up to the U.S. score fire profiles. And I've had this conversation with folks at Epic and Cerner, and uh, they're totally open to these. They just want the use cases and the justification of why it's needed. And this actually came up because we've been working with the CDC to get opioid management guidelines um, supported, and that was a, a stumbling block where we identified a need to map uh, locally. Um, and they're totally open. So um, I think um, as a pragmatic matter, the approach that uh, other initiatives can take, eMERGE can take, is to take important use cases that are understandable to them and to their um, uh, client stakeholders, us, basically, and say, this is why we need it. You know, it, it, getting it into the standard is the easy part, actually. It's getting the vendors to adopt it that's hard, especially because a lot of these codes are not already encoded in it internally. So again, like labs, we say link. Well, that's great. Some of them are already mapped in our EHR system. But whenever we do analyses, the mappings are oftentimes wrong or absent. So it's, it's, it's the kind of thing where the standard is only the first step. The degree of, to which it's actually supported by your vendor is probably really critical. Hey, this is a question for the, the phenotyping folks. Um, so, um, can you hear me now? So, um, you know, one of the, the tasks that, that could be part of the next round of eMERGE um, is essentially scaling up outcome assessment as we sort of return results to a larger and larger cohort of patients clinically. Um, so I wondered if you all had some discussion about how to take your existing phenotype definitions um, and turn them into um, outcome assessment tools so that might add, for example, timing of the emergence of different kinds of phenotypes in clinical uh, observation. I'll jump in there. The, um, I think that's a great use case because if you look at uh, some of our phenotypes have combined other phenotypes and use them almost as modules. So if you look at diabetes, um, if you look at myocardial infarction in the setting of drugs, so pharmacogenetic phenotypes, um, which one of the uh, group efforts that the outcome group has worked on um, have often have included sometimes compositions of multiple other eMERGE phenotypes. And that's a use case we've seen um, in other people that have adopted um, the eMERGE phenotypes. Um, I remember when we looked a couple of years ago at uh, type 2 diabetes, for instance, and uh, we saw that 
40 groups outside of Emerge had used that uh, phenotype in various different ways. And, and some of those were as outcomes, such as uh, outcome after um, uh, uh, transplant as uh, development of uh, new onset diabetes after transplant, so no doubt. I mean, they, they may just have to be modified to improve their sensitivity in some cases. Uh, my question goes back to something that Josh touched on. It's the difference between the amount of phenotyping need, needed to drive research discovery versus what is the ideal in the clinical collection. And I would say that one of the lessons we've learned here and in other arenas is that in research discovery, a little bit of phenotyping can go a long way as long as you can actually access it. So my question is, is there an opportunity to calibrate the difference and to... to I guess, determine whether what I'm saying is actually true, and then to build that into the future planning, lest we try and uh, do the perfect and miss out on the good. Yeah. That's an interesting thought. And, and maybe one way to do that is to kind of survey the different eMERGE sites for which ones truly do have this research repository, so an abstraction of their EHR, and which really are trying to use their EHR as it is. They have maybe a mirror version, but they're kind of running their scripts off of the mirror of the Clarity database as opposed to a full abstraction of Clarity and all the other databases within Epic into a research database and see if there are differences. Because I think there are some eMERGE sites that, that have that full research abstraction and others that are trying to kind of pull from the mirror version of the EHR. So I, I think that's an interesting thought, and I don't, I don't think we've done a lot of that yet. So this is Sean Murphy from Harvard. So my question is about this incoming EHR conglomerates. So there's been um, activity in Epic, for example, to create something called Cosmos, which is going to put together all the EHR data from all the different Epics or whoever signs in, and then something's going to be done with that data repository. And my question is, has anybody in this room ever participated in a uh, EHR-based conglomerate such as that, which, which worked out, right? I, I've heard many of these being initiated, and I, I, I just don't know of any. And I, I always hear this suggestion that, you know, we do this and so forth, but I've never heard of one that actually worked out. And you, you might think, like, why wouldn't that work out? And it's actually because EHRs actually do things in many different ways. I mean, there's like a hundred different types of flow sheets that you can have at Epic that could be managed in different ways, and they're not necessarily going to be put together in the same way. So I'm just wondering, has anybody done that? The, the only closest success I can think of is when GE abstracts data from their set of EHR vendor customers and creates a database that they share, but they're only taking a subset that was shareable, and they don't interact with the <clears throat> sites. It's just part of their contract that the data gets goes thrown in there. And so that... Have you seen it done for science, George? <clears throat> Have they validated? So, so you know... Well, I don't know that they've validated. It's been used in some studies. I don't know how it's validated. Okay, well, that's... The, used in some studies counts, because... What I see a lot is I'm not defending for Cosmos, quality. by the way. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> but quality, right? They define quality by it's what the code is. Period, right? There's no validation. It's just that's what it is. And and I've just never, I just don't have a good sense of is it useful for studying science or not. And I would just note that um, the bar for studying science and the bar for clinical care and financial management for a health system. I mean it. You know, it, it's, it's not that research is inherently needs higher quality data than actually taking care of the patient, too. So, I mean, it, it really just comes down to what's the quality of the data that got entered by the user. My experience, at least with Epic, is if you share Clarity queries with others, you can reuse them. Now, there are value sets that are um, uh, institution-specific, but then, so you need to do multiple iterations, but... Um, I've been pretty impressed by how easily I can um, share queries across institutions, at least on Epic. Yeah, I wanted to respond to that as well. I mean, this is really an implementation science question. Um, and we've not uh, really, uh, we've done, um, I think, uh, 
studies within eMERGE uh, that have looked at uh, things from an implementation perspective where we've mapped sort of the variability of implementation and looked to see are there best practices. But we've never used an implementation science framework like REAIM or something of that nature uh, to be able to study it systematically and in a reproducible uh, and reliable uh, and valid way. And so I, I was struggling, frankly, with Ken's talk because um, while uh, if Chris Shute were here, he would clearly have um, a thank you for the attention to standards. Uh, but the reality is, is that if we look at projects like Emerge, you know, the, the primary goal here is uh, discovery and implementation. And so the amount of effort that it takes to actually promulgate standards, um, you know, exceeds the available resources and would be an opportunity cost related to the primary goals of implementation and discovery. And so it's a real challenge to figure out what's the scientific question of the standards issue. But I think it could be approached in an Emerge 4 by taking an implementation science approach and saying, well, what's the cost of not doing this? And what's really needed? Where are the gaps? And so that, to me, would frame a scientific question. Mm -hmm. And Mark, can um, I respond to that as well? Right. So, so I, I was I'm just going to say, you guys have a couple of minutes. So Marilyn, if you want to respond, and if Marilyn, you and Josh want to do yeah. summary. Yep. Um, as I've been sitting here listening to the conversation and thinking about the synergizing with other groups, um, adopting some of these other standards, kind of changing the way we do things, that would mean we can't do 27 phenotypes the old way in Emerge 4, right? So in order to transition and, and try out different machine learning methods or um, do some of these other things, we would have to take from somewhere else unless Emerge 4 would have both a a do it the old way budget for phenotyping as well as a try some new things phenotyping budget. And my guess is that is not what we would be talking about. So, so I do think we should think a little bit about, you know, is there a way to, to combine the two of maybe experimenting with some of these alternative implementation of phenotyping strategies, but, but we wouldn't be able to do that and at the same time generate 40 new phenotypes. We'd have to think through, maybe we generate, you know, a fewer number, but in a, we come up with faster, more efficient ways to do them. I don't know. So that's kind of what I've been, been thinking about. Josh, do you want to? Oh, sorry. Just because it was mentioned in a couple of comments, I would caution against us moving in a direction where we're using the EHR as our research database. Most of us have changed EHRs. When we switch to EPIC in two years, it's going to have one or two years of data. So you need to have that separate longitudinal store and that's what we're doing queries against, because I don't want to get confusion in how the outcome is. Um, <clears throat> I wonder, uh, a lot of the challenge, it seems, that I'm hearing about phenotyping is figuring out how to take the kinds of measurements that we have used, that we currently use, and putting them into some sort of electronic uh, homogenized database that we can then ask questions from these, what, what are, by the time they are collected, retrospective data. And it seems to me the future of phenotyping is going to be digital real-time uh, physiologic monitoring uh, using micro devices and nano devices. And I wonder to what extent uh, you are thinking about those kinds of things. S sites are doing pilots on that. Different sites are doing pilots. There's no, I don't think there's a net-wide wide study. Yeah. 